Well, it's going to record. I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. This is the last uh, series of election forums sponsored by the Daily Interladies. Uh, it's been the first year we've done them, and we're enjoying the process. I hope you are as well. I'm Frank Neely, Managing Editor of the Interlake, and um, I encourage you all to uh, visit the Interlake's website for complete election coverage. Uh, because of early voting now, all the stories get into the paper uh, a lot sooner than people are used to in the old days. So uh, to uh, make up for that, we have them all online so people can follow uh, uh, those issues now when they need them. I want to thank uh, Flathead Valley Community College for letting us use this facility for four different events this fall. And uh, uh, also want to thank um, Mary Reckon and uh, Verdell Jackson for helping coordinate with the candidates uh, and helping make this possible. So we'll get started. Uh, tonight's forum will probably end around 8.30. Uh, we've been going till 9 o'clock with the forums that had 10 and 11 candidates, but uh, we'll probably uh, try to end this one a little earlier. Um, we'll begin with two-minute opening statements from the candidates, possibly stretching out to three minutes. It's my experience. And uh, I'm not going to be too rigid with the time clock. I'll try to be fair and uh, balanced about how people get to respond. And uh, we will take some questions or topics from the audience um, as, as we be begin. I'll, I'll ask a few questions myself, and then uh, we will uh, pursue some questions from the audience. Uh, it is about the candidates, so not about the audience, so I encourage anybody who wants to ask a question to make it quick and brief and direct, and we'll, we'll try to get the responses from the people that are actually running for office. So we'll begin with the opening statements, and we'll just go uh, down the line, and we'll begin with Gil Jordan, Democratic candidate in District 1. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, and uh, thanks to the Daily Interlake and to Flathead Valley Community College. We really appreciate the opportunity to do this, to address you all. And thanks to you for being conscientious enough to come out and see us and hear us face to face uh, instead of just trusting what you read uh, somewhere. It's very nice of you and very uh, committed of you to do that. Um, the three Flathead County Commissioners, I think it's important to note, administer a $78 million annual budget made up in part of your tax dollars employing 522 county workers who provide a wide range of essential services. It's a long list and it affects every single Valley resident. You know, think about it, roads and bridges, sheriff's department, emergency services, county courts, adult and juvenile detention, health department, planning and zoning, parks and recreation, county libraries, property taxes and appeals, elections, fairgrounds, landfill, that's just a short list, the list goes on and on. You deserve commissioners who are dedicated to serving all Valley residents and providing these services without favoring one group over another. I started working uh, when I was a freshman in high school and for all of the, most of, of the 50 years of my working life, I've been involved in community service, trying to make every community I lived in better. When I moved full-time to the Flathead in 1985, for example, it soon became very apparent to me that if I wanted fire protection up the line in the canyon, I needed to volunteer with the local fire department. I did that and have served in that department for 25 years. Community service is about seeing what needs to be done and being willing to pinch in and help, not sit back and expect someone else to do it. It also means being willing to look at all sides of the issues and listen to differing viewpoints before making decisions that affect us all. Now, in this campaign, people who don't know me have made some wild accusations about who they think I am, apparently unable or unwilling to run against who I am, they try and make me into something I'm not. Tonight, we should have some opportunities to clarify our positions on some of these issues. For the record, I am not anti-private property rights. In fact, I own private property and I defend those rights. And those uh, humble little Occupy gallery, the Occupy rallies are far from radical. My sign says, I care about you. I'm not sure how some equate that with redistribution or hating America. 
Uh, I do not have a political agenda. All I care about is finding solutions that help the most people and contribute to a healthy, balanced economy and community. And the reason I agreed to run for commissioner is because I want to serve this valley and I'm qualified for the job. I have experience administering million dollar budgets with 40 employees and planning and overseeing major capital projects. And in the Flathead, I have experience working in our schools, in our healthcare system, with our county library, and helping rejuvenate a local nonprofit community service organization. I know I'm known for working with people to find common ground and get things done. Again, I appreciate your willingness to attend this event, and I'm looking forward to serving you all as county commissioner. Thank you. Thanks, Gil. Let's keep the applause for a minute. Uh, we'll next hear from Cal Scott, who's interim uh, county commissioner in uh, District 1. I should point out that this seat uh, is the uh, seat that was vacated by the death of Jim DuPont, and uh, it has two years remaining on it, so the winner of this particular race will serve two years. The uh, other district is a normal six-year term. So we'll hear from Cal, who's running as Republican. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, Daily Interlake, and especially Flathead Valley Community College, which is a gem for our valley in training our people and our skilled workforce in this area. I just pray that we can build our community and our business development and growth so that we can employ the people that, that go through this wondrous opportunity for schooling. It's been a blessing for me to have served as your county commissioner for now a little over six months. It's been an opportunity where I've been able to truly help you. As Gil has referenced, we have a huge budget. That budget is your tax dollars. I've been blessed with the advantage of having to trim the budget by $2 million in the short time I've been there, to take a little over $1 million out of the capital improvements budget for the future, on projects that did not have what I call, in the business lingo, ROI. That is return on investment to the taxpayers. And I will tell you, unless there is a return on investment directly to the taxpayers on any project or anything that the county entertains while I am in that seat, it won't fly. It's just that simple. I'm wearing a shirt today that says, Back to the Basics. I attended a conference in 1997. I was asked to participate in a conference and speak down there with Terry Bradshaw and some other people to the mortgage lending industry with regard to what we needed to do in mortgage lending in the late 90s to get back to the basics, responsible lending to people that were qualified, that were able to pay the obligations. Now we all know many years later that didn't happen. A lot of people were harmed and hurt by what was engaged in in the mortgage lending practices over the years. However, even more than then, today, because the economy is where it is, because we don't have the jobs, we don't have the stability we had even back then, we are back to the basics. So it all has to make sense, and not just common sense, because common sense is only common to those that have knowledge and demonstrated ability to manage our money, our county, and the services that we provide. I am pleased to see that for the first time in print, uh, some of my information with regard to my background in this brochure. I've uh, been privileged to see a lot of things in print that have not covered much of my background, but some other issues, uh, which I may have an opportunity to explain tonight. In addition to the information that you see there and talking about my background, I think it's important to understand that my family came to this area in 1897. I attended schools in Kalispell, Columbia Falls, was raised primarily by my grandparents in this area. I graduated from Polson High School. And then I went on to a career, some of which is outlined in here, in ownership of many types of different businesses. During my time back here at home in these Come last 11 years, you're going to have to wrap it up pretty quick. Okay. I've served on the planning board, 
run a nationally awarded nonprofit organization for 23 years that has, that has helped tens of thousands of people in education and counseling, was a state director for the Association of Realtors, served on the National Housing Needs Committee for the Association of Realtors, and have been approved for and worked with Congress on educational and counseling programs Thanks. on a military basis throughout the United States. Thanks. Next, we'll hear from Clara Mears LaChapelle, who is running as a Democrat in District 3. Mr. Mealy, thank you, Daily Interlake, Flathead Valley Community College, and all the wonderful people that are sitting here tonight. I moved here 23 years ago, and granted, I wasn't born and raised here. My grandchildren are Montana natives. I wish I could say that, but no, I'm a Hoosier from Indianapolis, Indiana. I moved here with the hope that I could preserve my home for my children and my grandchildren when I'm gone so they could have the nice home that we have worked on since 1990 when we bought it. 2001, my granddaughter was born. In 2002, she was going to come visit me when my grandson was born. At that time, I had a fellow firefighter, firefighter, firefighter call me and say, don't give your water to your granddaughter. It will kill her. I found out that at that time, we had an extreme high concentration of nitrates in our water from an agricultural spill that will kill an infant in 24 hours or less. It depletes the oxygen supply in the system and the baby dies. There's no recourse. I almost killed my granddaughter if it was not for another firefighter calling me and saying, don't drink the water. We in West Valley are still on the same wells we had to put a new well in so that there would be no harm to my family. We still have people in West Valley buying bottled water and taking it out there. I decided to run for county commissioner because the average person and the small landowners in this valley have no say so no more. And I decided what West Valley has gone through in the last 10 years needs to be stopped now. Otherwise, we are going to totally tear this valley up and we will not be able to preserve anything. And the people that move here because of what we have to offer will go someplace else because we're going to look like any other U.S. city town. You can go anywhere else and get what you want. Cabela's came here because of what we have to offer. I feel we could entice more businesses here with what we have to offer. I would like to help the community here. I have a lot of people that I've gone to with meetings that is afraid to get up and talk to people because the average person in this valley has been beat up for so long, for so bad, and they just don't want to talk anymore, so they've given up. So I'm going to step up and I'm going to take their place. Thank you very much. Thanks, Claire. We're going to hear finally from Gary Kruger, who is running as a Republican in District 3. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you to the Interlake and to the Florida Valley Community College. And thank you to, to the participants or the people here. Um, I, too, am a Florida Valley resident. I'm a lifelong resident of the West Valley area. Um, and, and I stand for property rights. And I, and I stand for jobs here. I grew up in, and graduated in the early 80s, or 78, early 80s. And, and times were tough, just like they are today. And the thing that always kept me going was that I could find a job here. Today, that's not the case in Flatabella. There's people that have to leave here. And, and I was a fortunate one to be able to stay here. And, and that is why I am a pro-jobs, pro-business uh, commissioner candidate. Uh, I believe in the work ethic. I believe that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, living in the West Valley area, I'm very familiar with some of the things that my opponent has talked about, and there's a lot more to the story than, than you hear. Um, there's two aquifers up there. There's a, a upper one and a lower one. The lower one is pristine. The upper one is a, is a shallow aquifer. That aquifer has got some nitrate issues. Uh, there's been an extensive study of that, and there was no, uh, nobody wanted to point any fingers. But in, in those contaminated wells, pharmaceuticals were found. Those pharmaceuticals come from septic tanks of human use. They don't come from agriculture. 
And so this is part of the stuff that we hear as a commissioner or commissioners here when, when testimony is given to them and they have to sort through the facts that are fact, factual and those that are not. And, and when you make decisions off of partial facts or improper facts or just statements like we've heard here today, you end up with rules that overreach and are not friendly to business. Businesses can't be demonized at every corner. They aren't our demons. They are the, they are the providers of our jobs here in this valley. And we have properties out there that can sustain business and can sustain business in a clean way so that our students who have gone to our schools, I've got one of my uh, former teachers out here and in my audience, I was happy to see. Uh, I've been on the school board of West Valley for 22 years, so I, I hold education very dear to my heart. And, and I believe in what we do here. And I want our students from West Valley to be able to come back to their parents' place or to a new place. And so we have to create business. And we have to do it in a sensible manner, and we will. We have to allow our, our economy to get healthy, and we have to have a commissioner in, those seat, in the seats that will study the issues, learn the facts, and make decisions on the facts. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Okay, I'm going to ask the first question. After that, I will uh, check with the audience to see what topics of discussion you have on your list, some of which may be included on my own list, and then I'll call on people in the audience from time to time to cover some of those topics. First question, and I'll, I'll probably uh, I'll give everybody two minutes to answer. If everybody took two minutes for every answer for the evening, we'd only get in about nine questions. So. If you can answer the question in a minute, please do so, and we'll, we'll try to get more questions in. County's in a protracted fight with whitefish over donut representation, and many years ago, the county took away Kalispell's donut area completely. What would you as a commissioner do to smooth relations with the Valley Cities going forward? And let's start on the other end, and we'll work our way backwards, Gary. Uh, the donut issue is, currently it's in court. I, I hope that it isn't uh, decided by the courts. I would like to see the city and the county come to some settlement on the on that issue. Um, right now, um, as it stands, there's no way for people outside of a city to be able to give representation within the city. And there's been some discussion about going to the state legislature for some changes to do that. I believe that's wrong in that we should handle our local issues locally. We need to sit down as commissioners and, and with the better heads up there in Whitefish and come to an agreement of what uh, amount of control is acceptable up in that area for the donut residents. Um, you'll probably find there's some areas up there where donut residents would, would welcome the city to have some uh, thought in what their planning process is so that they knew they could be assured that say city uh, uh, services were going to come to an area. Um, there's some areas in this end of Whitefish that are a little bit wet and sanitation systems probably don't, or septic systems probably don't work and that system that the city could provide to those landowners might be a benefit to those landowners. And so I think that there's, if, if cooler heads would prevail and, and we would get uh, in, in the mode of we're going to work out the issue rather than to litigate the issue I think we would be much better off. Her? I think you need to get the people that live in the donut area actually together in a meeting with the commissioners and with the White Fish City Council. I think if you could get them together, put it to a vote for the people that live there, find out what their interests are and what they want for their community. I feel that would be the best thing and it would stay out of court because then the people are going to have the decision of what they want to do there and then they can vote on it and go from there and see what's going to happen. But I think you need, the community needs to be involved in this. Cal? I appreciate the comments of the two previous candidates. I live in the Whitefish Donut 
I followed the occurrences that have taken place there, much to the challenges for the city of Whitefish and the county and the residents. And yes, I agree, if we could mediate and mitigate the situation, that would be a wonderful opportunity for the community to pull together and accomplish that goal. However, that's been attempted time and time again. We just went through a mediation process not too long ago with the county commissioner's office and the city of Whitefish. It didn't work. We couldn't come together. I recognize as an individual living in that area that Whitefish needs to have some say into the entrances of their city. But I also realize that I and the other property owners in the Donut area need to have representation as to whoever is going to govern or dictate or inflict themselves upon the property owners. Therefore, I think there's only two possibilities in this if we cannot mediate it. And as it's been said, it is in the courts now. I would rather the courts didn't handle the situation, but that's where it's at. So I would favor, if it's not rectified by the courts and we cannot mediate, there are two opportunities. Either Whitefish annex the area and provide the services, and have the people have the ability to vote and have a control on, on those that are controlling their property or that the matter go to the vote of the people to decide what they want in their area. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when they set up these uh, interlocal agreements with Columbia Falls and Whitefish, they were absolutely identical. In 2005, the only thing that was different on them was that one said Columbia Falls and the other one said Whitefish. Now, why do you suppose that the Columbia Falls is getting along just fine with theirs and Whitefish isn't with theirs? The difference is that there was about 60 resolutions that were passed and only a handful of them, less than a handful, were controversial. There was also some resolutions passed in Columbia Falls and those weren't controversial. So everybody was happy. Everybody was happy with that. But the critical areas ordinance that was about water quality and serious uh, issues that people can have reasonable disagreements about suddenly turned that into a into a, a hot button issue. And so, at some point around sometime in 2011, a group from the donut area and some citizens from Whitefish recommended suggested a community council to be formed with uh, either seven or nine districts in the donut with a, represent a duly elected representative from each uh, district in the donut and that they would then take up any issue that came before the city council or, or came before the uh, citizens of the donut and they could make recommendations to the city council. And these are people that can be voted out of office. These are, and, and we all agree that the people in the donut should have representation. They should not have things inflicted on them without representation. I think I also hear that we all agree that it shouldn't be in court. Both the citizens of Whitefish and the citizens of the county are wasting tax dollars uh, getting litigation, which may or may not satisfy everyone. Instead of that, indeed, we should be sitting down. Now, there's this proposal on the table, and it was rejected out of hand. It wasn't allowed to go before, the, before a vote uh, by the commissioners, and, and no one ever took it seriously. I think it's a very reasonable and serious proposal that could bring people together and have representation for everybody, and uh, we could get on with it Thanks, and get out of court. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn to the audience uh, for a show of hands of people who have questions they would like to ask. Uh, and then I just would like a topic at this time. So how many people have questions they would like to put forward? Start on this side. What's your topic? Logging and uh, logging and Agenda 21. Okay. Logging and Agenda 21. Thanks. Wait, I'm not, not ready for the question. I'm oh, just going through the gear. Another Agenda 21, <coughs> if you don't know about Agenda 21, you're in for a, well, we'll see what happens. Okay. Uh, some very, very specific questions concerning the donut. Because it's still very vague and I like it. Okay. Follow up on the donut area. 
see if we have time for that. Other ones? Well, this would be directed specifically to Mr. Scott in reference to his the articles in the newspaper about his bankruptcy and his uh, failure to okay. describe his school. Question about Mr. Scott's background. Right. Any others? Okay. Public safety, more specific? Just what they will do about public safety, or do you have a specific area you're interested in? Is it a short question? Okay. Any thoughts on veteran relationship between the county and the city? Well, that was my question, and I didn't get an answer. <laughs> so, not sure you're going to either. Um, okay. Well, well, I'll check back in a little while and see where we go with those. Um, let's follow up with a question that is on a lot of people's minds uh, as uh, the county is in a growth well we were in a growth period unfortunately we're maybe in a retraction period right now but how does zoning fit into your vision of future planning for flatted county and specifically are you a proponent or opponent of zoning and how will you uh, how will you utilize zoning if you are elected commissioner and we'll start uh, uh, on this and this time uh, we'll start with Gil and then uh, we'll, uh, after we get through Cal, we'll, we'll just keep going, I guess. That seems to be the easiest way. We'll just reverse order on the questions. And zoning is a tool. And if it's badly, just like any tool, if it's poorly used, it has poor results. If it's well used and smartly used and is fairly used, then it tends to help economies, businesses, environments. Everything is helped when zoning is used in a reasonable and a uh, uh, planned way. The problem is when zoning just, just goes out of control and you try and zone everything. I think it was Mr. Lauman who pointed out that we can't zone every little inch, square inch of the county. But there are areas, and what I advocate and what I believe is a reasonable idea and helps economies is what's called cluster zoning. And that's where you put all like things together. So you don't take a business and put it out in the middle of an uh, agricultural field and, and ruin the agricultural uh, function. Uh, likewise, you don't, uh, you don't just put businesses all the way along a highway and ruin all of the property that's behind those businesses. But what you can do is put them all together in a place where they can all use the same utilities, the same roads, the same planning. It all goes together like that. And if you do that, everyone wins. The businesses win. The, the citizens who care about recreation and, and open space, they win. Everyone wins because all, you get all of those services clustered in one space. Okay. Cal? Zoning is a plan to provide foresight in planning for a community. It is a tool. However, one of the words that was just described as utilizing that tool is reasonable. That's a subjective terminology. I think what we find with our zoning today is that the subjectivity of that reasonable definition in zoning causes a lot of problems with our people. I think zoning needs to be addressed realistically with the growth policy, with the idea in mind that we have zoning text amendments that can be amended and changed to provide for zoning that does permit reasonable growth does permit growth of business, will allow us to move forward in a controlled manner. That requires careful planning and zoning. We have an exceptional planning and zoning department in Flathead County that does a remarkable job. And I think we need to take a look at what individual amendments to that zoning might include and adopt that along with our current growth policy which is a guiding document for the direction that our county needs to go and combine those together. Thanks, Cal. Clara? I feel zoning is a very important tool in this county. As we're seeing now, we are losing that. We need to bring it back. We have neighborhood plans that need to be remained intact. 
and worked with the zoning tool. If you take zoning and just open it up to anything all over this valley, you're going to have a free-for-all. You're going to have industrial on top of small parcels of land. I don't feel that's fair, and I don't think anybody that owns a small piece of park parcel of property would enjoy having an industrial park beside them. I feel it's a, a definite necessity tool, and I think if it's worked right and the people come together instead of fighting, I think it will be a great asset to this county. Thanks, Claire. Gary? Um, the zoning issue in Flathead County is an issue that has been troublesome to many residents for a number of years. Uh, it pits neighborhoods against neighborhoods, uh, friends against friends. And, and the reason for that is because is zoning and oftentimes in Flathead County gets used as a weapon against another uh, property owner. If, if zoning is used properly and what it's made to be used for, health, for the protection of the public, health and safety, it can be a tool. However, half of our county currently is zoned and half isn't. So the unzoned part seems to be the part that is getting all the growth of businesses that are growing along our highways and so on. And, those, and, that, and that chases businesses to certain areas. That's good and bad. And, and they're one of the things that's bad is I'm in my school district, the way we're zoned is we're a bedroom district. All we get in our district is houses that, develop, that, that produce children. And those children impact our school. And then our taxpayers in our area have to pick up the cost of education of those students when we need some businesses in our area. We need some businesses in our tax base. We were just fortunate in the last few years to pick up our, or that the school section uh, is in the West Valley School District and, and that business is in that, on that school section and that's where Lowe's and, and Costco are have been a huge uh, uh, help to our taxpayers, to, to relieve our taxpayers. So when zoning is used for planning, it can be a tool. However, we've got to be very careful how we're using zoning. We've used it uh, poorly in the past. And I believe that uh, it's going to take real, uh, some real looking at our regulations to make them so that we can keep ourselves business friendly so the businesses can develop in our more open areas and that we can provide those jobs for our kids that are coming back here. Thanks, Gary. <clears throat> well, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn the question over to Dick. And uh, uh, since I feel like the question was going to come up eventually anyway, uh, we'll get it early and well, see. I, I just wondered. Uh, I just wondered that uh, Mr. Scott talks about judging county expenditures on return on investment. He talks about managing our money. So given his background of running up $170,000 on over 22, on 22 credit cards, I don't know how he can do it. A question about Mr. Scott's financial dealings and. Uh, previous bankruptcy that he had. We'll let Mr. Scott respond. I thank you for the question. I have attempted several times to explain this through the media and the explanation has not been forthcoming to all of you, so I appreciate the opportunity to bring it out in the open now and explain it fully. As all of you know, in 2007 the economy took a turn. At that particular time, my wife and I and my family had gone by the book. We had made investments, we had saved money, we had paid for what we had, we had a few properties, we had done what people that are responsible do with their money, including retirement and investments that at age 65 would have paid all of our obligations and provided us a good income for the rest of our life. In the latter part of 2007 and the early part of 2008, that disappeared. Because of that loss of money, we were in a position now where we couldn't pay all of the debt. The debt at that time, which was only about $220,000 on all of our properties and our holdings. At that particular time, we owned assets free and clear. We had money in the bank. Our credit scores were in the high seven to eight hundreds. 
we had followed through with everything that a responsible person would do. If you look to my background, you can see that I was a financial counselor for many years, taught a lot of people financial and fiscal responsibility, consulted and wrote business plans for a lot of businesses and major corporations in the United States. I don't think there's any question that I've never understood responsibility and how to handle money. What happened to us happened to a few people and partially happened to a lot of people during that time frame. We sold a lot of our assets to pay obligations and bills. A fifth wheeler that we had paid cash for down at Gardner, $16,000, we sold it for $9,000 to apply to bills and debt to pay the mortgage. A boat that we had purchased cash, paid for, sold it for less than half. The diesel truck that we had to haul those vehicles that we had paid for, I traded in on a Subaru Tribeca so that I could continue to drive teaching for border regulatory regulation throughout the state of Montana during the winter in a safe manner. And it reduced our outgo because it was a less expensive vehicle for me to drive. When all of this happened, we couldn't recoup the investment. We knew that we were done. We were sitting there with the debt. We went to an attorney. We sought counseling. There was no question that our only alternative was bankruptcy. When we filed for bankruptcy, we were not late on any of our obligations or our bills. We had sold our assets to pay our debt. We still had good credit scores, but we knew it couldn't continue. We filed for the bankruptcy in late August of 2009. The bankruptcy was discharged in January of 2010 without question. Later in 2010, we reopened the bankruptcy to distribute money that we had gotten from an unexpected tax return to pay it into the trustee for distribution to the creditors. Where the date that you've read about in the paper 2011 comes from, I have no idea. Other than perhaps, it may have been when the home that we were in finally sold for $165,000, of which we paid $240,000 for and paid over $40,000 down payment and closing costs. A home that we couldn't sell and that we couldn't rent. When we found out we couldn't make the payments in that, we moved out of that home. I've let you go beyond time because of the I appreciate question. that very much. Uh, I think people need to know this. If, if there is any final precise statement you wish to make, I'll let you make okay. one more final statement and then I'm going to move we on. We cleaned up the home and moved out when we knew we couldn't make the payments any longer and winterized the house. I cleaned up the car, polished it, serviced it, and handed the keys to the gentleman in South Kalispell because we couldn't keep up the payments. We could have stayed in that home for another okay. year and a half. Thanks, Gil. All right, Cal. And I could have taken advantage of people, but we didn't. Okay, I'm going to uh, in, invite the other candidates to uh, talk in, in a general way about a topic that's related to that or to reflect on uh, anything Cal said or their own situation. Uh, the question is uh, about integrity. Integrity is a vital part of being a county commissioner, just as it is, as it is for any elected office. Give examples of your own integrity and how it will affect your, your own ability to serve in county government. And uh, we'll let Cal briefly respond at the end of that as well, but uh, I want to hear from the other candidates first. Let's start with Clara and then Gary. I have always been able to pay my bills and everything, and yes, I had to file a bankruptcy. It was a small one, but I had lost $2,400 a month in income. There's not one person in this room that would not have had to do the same thing that I did. I have a handicapped grandson that I help take care of and keep his mom and his and my granddaughter in a home. We have families here doing the same thing that I did. It still hurts to this day. I've always been a very responsible person and I will be very responsible with your money in the valley because I think it's your money and I will protect it and fight to keep it 
and we'll get this county back on track. Aaron? We've heard here some stories of, of difficult times for a couple of people, and, and we know people all throughout the valley that have, have had difficult times and are having difficult times. Today we have people in North Dakota, young men and young women that are over there just trying to struggle by. And the important thing here is not what has happened to a single person here, but it's what has happened to our valley. Our valley is a place where we seem to tell the businesses, and eh, we don't know if we want you here, or you're not good enough. Businesses that create jobs and can do it in a way that, and follow our rules that keep clean environment, are welcome here. They're welcome under my thought scheme. We need to bring those people back so we don't have more stories like we're hearing here. We need to have those young men and young women raising their families so that their students that go to West Valley School can say goodbye to dad in the morning. We need that because that's our family values that we need in this valley. Prime rate goes down, attendance at schools goes up, graduation goes up, everything goes up if we have jobs. And jobs are created because we tell a business, come to our place. You're welcome here. That's the important issue here tonight, is who's out there and going to fight to put businesses in our valley floor and put jobs in our valley. And I'll do that. And I'll work for that. Um, and I, I think we're going to have some more questions. I'm going to be really happy to answer about jobs and where we can create jobs. Thanks, Terry. Dylan? Um, those are pretty big numbers. Uh, Cal and and I, uh, it, it's hard for me to relate to them. And I know that everybody went through a financial downturn. We all experienced that in uh, late 2007, early 2008. And the reaction of most of us was to pull in our wings and be careful and not spend any more money and uh, and and not make things worse than they already were. We all got hit. I mean, I I lost a third of everything I put away too. But I have one credit card, and I have no personal debt, and there's no debt in the organization that I run, the nonprofit that I run. They had some when I got there, we got rid of it. And I'm a pay-as-you-go kind of guy. I believe if you can't afford it, you don't buy it. And I would hope that the county could be run in the same manner. They have a fairly small, they don't have very much debt. They occasionally have to run some up to do a, a long-term large project, but they, they keep it to an absolute minimum. I think it's in the one or two percent range. In any event, the point is, that's the way you should run the county. And uh, so, with my background and what I've always done, I've never paid a nickel of interest on a credit card because I always pay it off at the end of the month. I don't buy something unless I know I can pay it off at the end of the month. Now, I've done that for 30 years. So, uh, that's, yeah. Okay. Uh, Cal? Well, I suppose the question is integrity, and that bodes to the question that the gentleman asked before, I suppose, so I'll continue to explain some of that. Uh, with regard to the credit cards, 22 credit cards, $174,000 in debt. My wife and I had eight of those credit cards. We had children, grandchildren, and ill grandparents at that time. I'm responsible for all of that debt. However, I think a lot of you know by the time you throw on the brakes on a freight train, especially when you're trying to recoup rather substantial, large investment that you lost, suddenly, that by the time you throw on the brakes on that freight train, you've incurred some damage. And we picked up some debt. I will tell you that our plan has been and will continue to be to save and do all we can to repay every penny of that debt. It's not within my faith or my belief to have done this, but for the sake of my family and what we needed to, to accomplish at that point, we didn't have a lot of choice. With regard to the credit cards, we've not had a credit card in three and a half years. I don't use credit. I pay cash for everything. With regard to the integrity issue, 
that bodes to us personally, myself and my family. We own our own home now. We pay taxes on that home. We pay personal property taxes on our property. Okay, hey, Cal, I'm gonna break, break it off. I said I'd give you a brief response time. And I'm gonna see if anybody else oh, wants yeah. to respond to anything else and see if this needs to be continued. If not, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on to another topic. Um, this one's about kind of some of the polarized atmosphere that's present in this community as it is in a lot of the country. Uh, and it takes as its example two local groups that seem to be at opposite ends of the spectrum. America Dream Montana and Citizens for a Better Flathead are two of the most vocal activist groups that will appear before the county commissioners. Will you give equal weight to what both groups have to say when they appear before you and how important do you think organizations like this are in helping you make your decisions? And uh, let's begin with uh, Gary at that end and move this way. Thank God for freedom of speech. Uh, both of those organizations have that right, freedom of speech. And I will listen to both organizations. But, you, but, the, but the answer is in the question. Those two groups are at both at opposite ends of the spectrum. And where we end up with most likely in a lot of our stuff will be somewhere in the middle. And that is how we do things in America. That's how we do things in this county. That's why we have the system we have. Thank God for that ability to be able to go out and say, I don't like this or I do like this. And we will end up closer to the middle. Both of those organizations stand behind something very good. They are both trying to protect this valley, one more so than the other. They have a right to come to the commissioners and speak their piece as everyone in this room has. And I as a county commissioner will listen to these people. I have been on the other side with some of those people. And at the times that we were going through our really issues in West Valley, of which still stand as far as our contaminated water, where it came from, we know for a fact of where it did come from. It was an agricultural spill. I do have the documentation. So I know what it is to go in front of the county commissioners and have somebody turn off the air block and they don't listen to you. I am not going to be one of those. If you come to me, I will listen to your issues and we will find a way to work and resolve this. Thank you, Cal. As a county commissioner, I believe I have 91,000 approximate bosses. Party has nothing to do with the practice of a county commissioner. It has to do with administering the, the six basic divisions that we have, the 39 departments that we administer, and the nearly 30 boards and committees that we're involved in, and all of the people that have all the input from the county into those groups. That crosses party lines. I am a Republican, and I'm proud to be a Republican, and I'm running as a Republican. And I am that because I believe in the free enterprise. I believe in business growth and development the responsible handling of our government so that people can have more of the money that they earn and keep it in their pockets. Those are basic concepts. The fundamental freedoms that we have, our Constitution, our United States of America, those are the values that I hold dear. That doesn't have anything really to do with politics. It has to do with our United States of America and all the people that live here. And we need to listen to, and I will listen to everyone. I've met with community groups, organizations, all across the board in my short six months as commissioner. And I'll continue to do that to serve the needs of the people. That's how I feel Thanks, about the party politics. Gil? Uh, it, it's about listening to people and showing people respect. Uh, the examples that 
Frank has given us are on opposite sides of the spectrum, uh, ideological spectrum. You need to listen to people with respect and pay attention to what they're saying. I, I used to coach debate at Whitefish High School and I used to tell the kids, I said, listen to your opponent and listen to the sources that he or she is offering and then respond directly to what you're hearing. And I believe we need to do the same thing with American Dream or with Citizens for a Better Flathead. We listen to their arguments, to their thoughts, to their philosophy, if you will, to their concerns about what we're doing. And then we consider the source, we consider what, and we ask them. If, we, if it's not clear to us, we ask them, what is the source for that material? What's the, where did you get that? And then when you're all done with all that, if you've done your listening properly, and, you're, and you've shown these people respect, then you can make a reasonable, good decision uh, when you're done. With all due respect, Gil, I haven't signed anybody, either the American Dream or Citizens for a Better Flathead's petition. Can you say the same? Uh, well, I think you started out talking, Gary, about uh, the freedom of speech and the ability to say what we think. Uh, I'm not a county commissioner. I'm running for county commission. And I think I still have a right to express my thoughts and my views. Signing a petition for someone that is saying something that you believe in, I believe is still part of freedom of speech. It's freedom of speech, but it also kind of aligns you with them. Kind of aligns me with them, all right. I, 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 guess, I, I guess we all are aligned with some groups. Uh, I suspect uh, in, your, in your world, uh, in a, there's some agricultural groups that you're aligned with and that you support and that you feel strongly about. I think that's all of our rights to do that. Now, the, the way that it gets different is if indeed you, you are a county commissioner, then you have to be very careful about who you align with and what you, how you express yourself. Uh, because you have a responsibility now to a, the entire population of the valley. Uh, but prior to that, I don't think we should be restricted in our ability to express ourselves and say what we think. And I'll defend it. Uh, you know, we don't have time here tonight, but I'd be glad to defend all of those points that were brought up in that petition. Thanks. Anybody else want to? Stand yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a comment Go quickly. Um, <laughs> before and during my tenure as county commissioner, I have sat and met with Citizens for Better Flathead, Highway 93 North neighbors, Russ Crowder and his group, American Dream Montana. When I sat on the Flathead County Planning Board during 2004 and 2006, I listened to everybody. In our recent passing of a growth policy, in which we removed layer upon layer of redundant regulation that inhibited our process in the county and threatened our ability to move forth with reasonable planning, and added property rights to that growth policy, I had already met with all of the groups, opposing and for, and listened to them carefully as to what they had to say. Then I had to go back and look at the information, the history of the policy, the history of what I was hearing, and the documents, and make a decision. That's the role of a county commissioner. It crosses party lines and special interests. Thanks. Can we move on? Um, I have something to say in regards to that. As far as a personal property owner, <laughs> now with the new regulations that they have put in front of us into the county, they have now taken away the personal property rights and they have put in there that regardless if you're a one acre, a hundred acre, whatever, the developer of that large piece of property is now has the trump card and he will have the say so you will no longer have the say so thanks claire um i'm going to go ahead and go back to the audience we have two questions about agenda 21 which as i understand it is an international un sponsored um, uh, 
plan for land use and how land should be developed and go to the lady and, and then I'm going to see if Fred wants to add anything as well. But let's try to keep it quick and, and to the point because a lot of people aren't going to understand the relationship to county government, so try to make it clear. Agenda 21 is not something you can put in something real small. Uh, we have to. We have to. Uh, Jen, uh, first of all, this, all four of you, can you just raise your hand? Do you understand or know about Agenda 21? <coughs> um, Agenda 21 has a potential to be near the goal across America. It comes under the guise of names like sustainability, smart growth, water quality districts, IPI, ICL. Um, in, the, in the end, its regulations and restrictions go beyond the pale for folks living, especially in the rural lands. You and Agenda 21 would have had to have been ratified in our United States Senate years ago, so it was better for the powers that be to institute it incrementally throughout our communities all across America. Um, I guess my, my simple question is, would you protect our county? And I love planning, I love it, I got to take care of the environment, most of us do, we are responsible citizens. I recycle, uh, but um, would you protect our county from the onslaught of Agenda 21? And are you even aware of it? And I do have this, I do have information. I mean, wouldn't have to pass it out to all four of you uh, very shortly. Okay, time. thank you. And Fred, is there any, is that adequate for you for, for this topic? Okay. So we're going to. I will. You're talking about a lot. I, I know, and we may be able to come back to that. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and start with Gil. Well, sure. The short answer is you protect the county if the county is threatened, uh, or the people, actually, the people of the county, if the people of the county are threatened. Um, I guess I would need to see some serious documentation that says that this is an imminent threat. Now, I'm sure, and I respect people's opinions and, and points of view and where they get their information, uh, but the fact that, well, well here, here's a question. How many people in the audience know about uh, Agenda 21? Okay, uh, I would say that's about a third to a little, little more than a third. Okay, if this is an imminent threat and if it's something that the county needs to be aware of in order to protect the people that live here, I kind of think that it would be, it would be universally known and we'd all be out there uh, up in arms and, and wanting to stop it. Uh, at this point, I don't think it's that serious of a threat. If it becomes that, then you bet. I'll be right there on the barricades with you. Okay, Cal? I'm, I'm a little taken aback about the lack of perspective on how Agenda 21 affects us in the county. We, you talked about logging. We have a serious issue with our forests. There's a term called coordination. That's a mandate. That's the ability for our county, our people here, to sit at the table with our forest service and those that would control our natural resources and our forests in our area to negotiate and work with them. Our county has to be at that table. We cannot back away from that. If you talk about logging, we've gone from uh, a plethora of logging in this area that was very supportive of this community and our industry in this area. As a kid growing up here, that was the mainstay of what we did, that and our agriculture. And then came the aluminum plant and a few other things. Our logging has gone from over three million board feet years ago to less than a million now in this area for no reasonable reason other than protecting a resource that we can't utilize. We have trails and pathways and roads that we have used for years and years responsibly and have taken care of them, where now the roads are being shut off. We have, I believe now, about eight miles of road that we as citizens can utilize in our forest in this area. That, I think, is overstepping the boundaries that are reasonable for the resource that we have here. That's part 
of an Agenda 21 that comes down from the federal levels and affects us here in Flathead. And we need to be mindful of that and not hide and stick our head in the sand on this one, believe me. Thank you. Claire? I feel that if we all come together as a community, we can stop it, we can prevent it, and we can well, and the logging, I agree with Cal, you know, we, I've got friends that are now sold their logging companies and they are working in North Dakota. I see what it is to have families split up. But we need to come together as a community. If we stick together as a community, of which I know I have seen us do, then we can prevent, you know, Agenda 21. And we can work together as people. And I would love that so much. <laughs> Gary? It's pretty obvious that, uh, that, that some of us here, some, some people don't understand Agenda 21 and the catchwords that come with Agenda 21. The smart growth that is pushed upon us by, by the citizens and, and those type of things. We can't stack and pack people in Kalispell, Montana. We have open country. People that are here are here because they like that openness of this area. They want to build their house in the fringes. They want to build in the timber. They want to build out on some next to some agricultural ground. And if you were to use the cluster provisions or the cluster where we just say every house has to be built within one quarter mile of Kalispell, Whitefish, or Columbia Falls, you're going to look exactly like Las Vegas. That's how Las Vegas grows. They go out there, they carve out a little piece of BLM land, and then they put houses on it, and every house looks the same. You've got four models of a house, left or right. So if you want a left-hand model A house, boy, that's the place to go. If you want to live in Kalispell, Montana, you've got to reject a little bit of this stuff. We need to reject some of the push that we're getting from uh, these groups that use that, that paper, those papers. Basically, Agenda 21 is those papers. I've read through them. Uh, there's, a, there's some good ideas in them, but just not very many. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> you don't want me to keep going? <laughs> you did a good job. Um, I'm going to touch on logging uh, back to it and uh, just to incorporate that. And I'm sorry for having looking at let you follow up because I don't know exactly where it's going to go and we're running out of time. Um, it, the creation of more jobs in Flat, Flathead County routinely surfaces during election cycles. So uh, what role do county commissioners play in local job creation, if any, including in the logging industry? And uh, let's uh, uh, start it. Let's see. We'll vary it a little bit. Let's start with Clara and then go to Gary and then Cal and then Gil. <coughs> Well, I kind of like spoke on the logging industry, but I would like to talk about agricultural areas that have taken West Valley and now, as a lot of people in this room know, that we have been pushed with gravel pits out in West Valley. We now have three from my home within about four miles of each other. If you are a small landowner when this was going on, you had no right to say anything because the landowner with larger property got what he wanted. I do not feel that's fair. They in turn now, of course the businesses have quit, but they have really torn up West Valley and the people out there are still upset, especially with having to, you know, buy a bottle of water to take home and cook. I feel that the small landowner and the businesses, sure, you're entitled to do what you need with your property to survive, but I don't feel at the cost of your neighbor. Okay, the question was about jobs, and, but I'm sure Gary wants to talk about gravel pits. <laughs> well, actually, I'd like to follow up later with gravel pits. I hope somebody will ask that question. But I do want to go back to the jobs and the timber. We have, we, we've got a timber industry that has suffered in this area. It suffered because the sales weren't happening, because they were fought in the courts, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, tim, and the sales that should have been there on federal lands weren't happening. We need to have those sales back. 
There's some provisions in our growth policy where we, we say that we are going to coordinate with other agencies. And, and I think that we need to take, and, it, and, and we can, as long as we have Republicans in our House of Representatives and our state and our governorship, we can put together a group that's going to coordinate and ask the federal government to let us have some of our uh, lands for use. Those federal lands are all of our lands, but we need to manage them so that we have more opportunity for timber harvest. We need to manage them so that we have more opportunity for recreation. As we grow this valley, this we can only expect to have to have more places to fish and to hunt and to camp. And what happens in our federal lands and, our, and even some to our state lands is we shrink those numbers. We say, oh, we're gonna close down this campground. We're gonna shut down this road. As we shut down roads and trails in our, in our areas, our timbered areas, what we do is we concentrate people onto less and less area, and that creates greater impact. The way to, to spread that impact out is to open it up a little bit. Let's get some trails into some more of these. Let's do a little bit more logging. We don't have to clear cut. The timber industry will do what they need to do and they will make it feasible. We need to have those jobs. Those jobs were very important for our kids. Back when I graduated, a lot of kids went into the timber industry. It was high paying jobs. It isn't the $7.85 or whatever the new number is an hour jobs. It's the, it's the jobs that they can raise a family at. They can buy a home. Those are the jobs we need, the manufacturing jobs. Thank goodness we've got a manufacturing, some people in manufacturing that have come here and are building rifle barrels out just outside of town. They, they're employing people at higher paying jobs. Manufacturing is something that we can send a product out of the valley, the money comes back here. The service industry, where I stand to your back and answer your mind, does not help our economy. Thanks. Well, well, there's some misinformation out there from the standpoint of, of mentioning what can the county do to create jobs. County and government does not create jobs. It certainly shouldn't create jobs. Government can adopt policies that will create jobs by fostering business and entrepreneurial growth and development in an area. Reasonably, that can be handled, that can be done. We desperately need that here. We have farming communities that are zoned in such a manner now that a farmer can't have any other extraneous business other than farming. There's restrictions against a farmer being able to utilize the equipment he has, welding equipment, machinery, and so forth for another enterprise on his farm because he has a zoning regulation that prevents him from running another business. Those are some of the text amendments that I alluded to with regard to zoning that may allow some of our rural zoning to develop business from enterprises that already exist that can hire people and grow jobs. It's policies that do that. The government doesn't create jobs other than occasionally through capital improvement projects like remodeling a courthouse or something like that or, or work on the private sector. Other than short term, the county doesn't create jobs. Thanks, people Gil. and business do. And finally, Gil. You know, that's right, uh, the county doesn't directly uh, create those jobs, uh, but the innovation and the creativity of the timber industry, Plum Creek's doing pretty well. They're still one of the largest uh, job, uh, have, uh, among the most jobs in the, in the valley. Stoltz has a very creative new way to, to use uh, wood chips and to use the products, the byproducts of the timber industry. And those are great things. You know, we need balance in these things. We, we certainly, we need to encourage the timber industry to remain and to be here. It's an important source of jobs. It's an important source of material to help build the economy. Uh, at the same time, uh, and, and Gary, yeah, you bet, that the timber industry knows that you, it's no longer okay to just clear cut, and just uh, destroy everything. They're, they're, they figured that out and they're, they've 
brought in new ways to do it that are much less destructive and still produce the timber that, that people need. As long as people want to build houses, there'll always be a demand uh, for timber. And that's great, and we should encourage that. At the same time, you need a balanced economy that recognizes there are lots. Uh, it, let, let me go back to a second to the idea that decades ago, this area was dominated by the timber industry. Now, if you think that you could have one industry dominate for all of time, uh, I think that's an unreasonable expectation. It needs to be balanced with all the other things that we've got here, with a small business and with the tourism and with the service jobs and uh, all the different jobs and, and types of economy that we have here. That's, that's called balance. And if one part of it is unhealthy, then that all of it is unhealthy. You need to have everybody getting along and working together, otherwise, uh, if, if you do, the, if you have policies that just favor one type of industry or one type of business, uh, ultimately it's going to get unhealthy. So we need to take care of all of those. Thanks. I'm going to go back to the audience and find out what the mysterious question about public safety was. So if you would make a quick statement or question, and we'll see if we can get that answered. Try to speak a little louder so people in back in here. I believe that the county commissioners have a concern for public safety. We should be concerned about public safety. I like the questions that we want to know that come out of Jager Day. Um, and I think that public safety is something that we should be concerned about. I have a concern. Um, this is years after the question about the fund. I recall an article from the Netherlands uh, in 2008 where he quoted. West Valley resident Clarence Washington Powell told the square cash in the new past gravel truck, pulled in front of it and slammed on her brakes and she was upset and how the drivers were behaving. And I quote, I think the driver crashed his pants. I would like you to comment on that as far as the building circuit from the city. Okay. And I'm going to repeat the question in, in uh, general terms so people in the back didn't hear it can understand what you're responding to. Uh, there was a story, and was it 2008? 2008 story in the Interlake uh, reporting on a uh, uh, s s meeting about gravel pits and neighborhood planning and uh, uh, Miss Mira Chappelle, La Chappelle uh, uh, was quoted in that story and she can say whether it's accurate or not uh, as saying that she had illegally passed a truck in order I guess to teach it a lesson and, uh, and then slammed on the brakes and uh, scared the truck driver. So uh, the question is whether or not she stands by what she did and uh, how she feels about her behavior, if I understand the question. Okay, so Clara. After all that we have gone at Church Drive and Farm to Market, I'm two tenths of a mile from that intersection. I have seen the truckers and they have vowed to the fact that they they don't have the time to stop. They will lose money. They have rolled through that intersection, put people in the ditches. Back then when the operations of these gravel pits were going on, I was not the only one that had to do that. We called the highway patrol and all that Schillinger's company, and Bruce Tevitt owns the pit, Schillinger runs that. They said they were never cited for any incidences or anything. That was not true. The highway patrolmen had been called out there numerous times by all the valley residents within that intersection. And it got to be where one day the truck come out and put my daughter's car in the ditch. And at that point, I had had enough. With all the phone calls, the calls to Schillinger Construction, will you please get your truck drivers to stop? Nothing was ever done. And to this day, when they use that pit, the truckers still roll through church drive and farm to market. They do not stop. So I had had enough after they put my daughter and my two grandchildren in the ditch. Okay, no, no follow-ups, please. Uh, I, I, I'd like to know if Gary wants to respond and, since he's in the race against Clara. Uh, coming from the West Valley area, uh, I will never be a vigilante commissioner. 
I, that is the wrong way to take uh, any issue that might bother you uh, on. You don't do that. That's common knowledge. Um, I, my house is right on Church Drive. The trucks that come from the gravel pits go right by my house. They, uh, I went and, and allowed the construction companies to uh, widen the corners. I gave them property. And, and I did it because it made it safer. I believe in safety. And if, if I see a truck driver, I've got, I've got the numbers for the, for the companies that are running out there. If they're driving too fast, I call them up. They know that. We police ourselves in the construction. And, and some of these things that are stated that are happening um, just aren't happening that I see. I'm on the road out there all the time. I live right there. Um, I guess that's, uh, if something bothers you so much that you believe that you need to go out and try to wreck a truck, you're, you got something wrong and you shouldn't be running for commissioner. Frank, can I answer to that? Uh, let's see if any of the other candidates have any interest in weighing in on this before we return to you. Anybody else? Cal? I'll, I'll jump in there. Uh, I'm not going to judge Clara. Uh, it's not within my ability to judge a human's heart and mind, and I just won't go there. However, with regard to public health and safety, that is part of my mantra in the campaign. So I firmly believe that the essential elements for the Flathead County are to care for our people, the public health and safety and essential services for our people in the area. And the definition of that, we could go on, but it's fire, police, protection, schools, the health issues, pertussis, flu, what have you, uh, as well as our regulation of our restaurants, the services that we provide that our citizens utilize in the area. All of those issues are critical. They need to be viewed carefully because our public health and safety and our essential services are critical to all of us. Thanks. Gil. Well said, Gil. Thank you, Gil. Okay, Clara, you can get a quick response. Okay, hey, first of all, I'm not a vigilante. I happen to be one of the EMS personnel for the state of Montana. I was a national exam registry examiner. I've tested your EMTs here. I've worked with the fire departments all across the state. I've done that for, I was EMS, ended up being 20 years. This truck driver had more than enough time, believe me. My dad was a trucker, so I know just exactly how much room they need before they're gonna crash. I wouldn't have risked my life, but it was at the point where we needed to get somebody's attention to get this stopped. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> I was going to compliment the candidates on being a little bit better than the presidential debate. I guess that's a matter of opinion, as everything is. Um, let's try to do a couple of quick rounds of questions so we can get in as much as we can. Uh, I'll ask the candidates to keep responses to these uh, couple of questions to 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and we'll just start with Gil on this one and go down. Uh, are neighborhood plans an effective land use planning tool? And, uh, you know, would you support uh, neighborhoods that want to use that process? Oh, absolutely. It, it makes eminent sense that the people who live in the neighborhoods know what, it's, it's all about local. You know, we always talk about local. We don't want our decisions made far away from us. And neighborhood plans, and we have a bunch of them, as, as Cal mentioned, there's some 30 boards and many of those are, are neighborhood uh, folks putting together neighborhood plans. They know what's going on in their community. They know what the needs are and what the concerns are. And so those folks know better than anyone. And when they make recommendations to the, to the county commissioners, I believe the county commissioners should really listen to them. If they hear something that they think is I don't know, illegal or wrong or bad, they can discuss it with them. But that's the whole point. These folks come in with good ideas and they present them to the commissioners and then there's a discussion that takes place and then policy is established based on those neighborhood plans. Uh, 
you know, I grew up in the canyon, and we went through some of this process up there a, a couple of a decades ago, and it was really valuable to see citizens come together, neighbors come together, and talk to each other about what's going on in the neighborhood. Uh, I think it's extremely valuable. Thanks. Cal? We have uh, several neighborhood plans. Uh, when I was on the planning board in 2004 and 2006, I did an outreach to some of the communities, Marion area being one of them, to ask them if they wanted to guide what growth was coming to their area and what was inevitably going to happen, and I was about run out of town and I lived there. Uh, they weren't interested in a neighborhood plan because of their individual personal property rights and they feel they wanted to, to, to dictate what they would do on their own property without any particular planning or guidelines. The neighborhood plans that we do have in place are in dire need of updating at this particular time, updating with regard to the current situation that we have, not only in our economy, but the business climate uh, and other rules and regulations that we have. One example of that is uh, West Valley neighborhood plan, for instance. I know a few years ago there was a lady out there that wanted to sell her farm. Um, Aggie was uh, going blind. We're not going to be able to take a long story here. Okay. She wanted to sell her property and she couldn't because a 1960 soil study dictated that that was agricultural land. Uh, broken shale and loam that in today's world was not productive. Thanks. Claire? I think neighborhood plans are very instrumental in protecting the people that live in that small little community. I think if people were to get together, lay out your plans, bring them to the county commissioners, I'll work with you on that. And we'll make sure that we come to an understanding and everybody in that community is happy and pleased with the outcome of it. But I think neighborhood plans are very instrumental and, and they will protect the individuals that live in that community. Aaron. The neighborhood planning process is a process that has to be that has to happen within the community. It has to be an open process, a process where everyone gets a, gets to be at the table, and a process that comes away with a plan, a neighborhood plan. That is not a regulation, and I think a lot of people in this room, probably in the valley, think that the, the neighborhood plan is the regulatory document. It is not the regulatory document. The neighborhood plan is just that, it's a plan. It's like when you get out of college and you say, my plan is I'm going to go to a job, I'm going to go to, uh, I'm gonna build a house in this area, hopefully I'll be married and we'll have three kids. That doesn't mean that that's how it always happens. You might go to try to find the job and can't find the job. So neighborhood plans have to be a living document, a document that is updated. West Valley plan, for instance, is uh, 16, 17 years since the last time it was updated. Every neighborhood plan in the, in, that is held within the county growth policy should have been updated in the past five years. We're sitting here with, a, uh, uh, with neighborhood plans that we're planning for our area from a time before we had cell phones. So they don't even know what to do with a cell phone tower. Today is different. And we need to be able to update that. Now, what's going to come with updating those plans is cost. The number of FTEs that it's going to take within the county to update all of the plans within the next five years and turn around and do it again in the next five years as per state law, because that's another thing we need to watch in the county okay. is following the law. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll try to get through a few more questions. Uh, this one kind of. Uh, uh, poses a, uh, a philosophical question, but it also has legal implications. Is there any type of development you would oppose? Do you feel you are legally entitled to vote to stop development just because you don't personally agree with it? And we'll go ahead and uh, start with Gary and work our way back. Development is a process. It's not a determining word development or, or something that happens happens through that same type of process that I just got done with. It's a public process. There's a process where somebody makes an application to our zoning uh, department. The staff reviews it. It's, it's, it. Letters are sent to immediate neighbors within 150 feet. They're allowed comment that will be included into the, the staff report. 
the staff looks at all the impacts, there's criteria for what those impacts are, and then it is sent to the next board, which would be the, uh, if, if say it goes to a neighborhood planning board, neighborhood planning board then looks at anything in there that they might think is relative to the issue, then it goes to the planning board. The planning board then looks at it, and, and from those facts that are developed or, and from the testimony that is taken from the, the people at the at hearings, findings of fact are developed. And findings of fact are what we determine whether or not something can be somewhere or not. And the reason why you do the findings of fact is so that you know you're separating the wheat from the chaff. And that when you decide, when you look at something, uh, some sort of a uh, business or something, you can then say, you know, it almost fits here. It doesn't quite, it needs a mitigation condition. That condition can be put on to mitigate something like site buffers or whatever that may be. It might be a traffic impact that it's putting on a road. There might be a, a, a condition put on to uh, improve the road in the area. And, and that is the process. It's not a black and white. Well, that, that one I like and that one have to don't. Move Thanks. Claire? I think when we have industrial parks moving in on residential areas, I think the impact studies that are have been going on in the past need to be extended some. There has been some that have been very extensively that were totally ignored by the county commissioners. As a county commissioner, I am not going to ignore those policies and people that have spent the time and money to go after and research out the projects that will hamper or be detrimental to their their neighborhood, I will be one that will investigate and keep this on. I'm a very detailed person and believe me, I will make sure that whatever type of you know projects going on is not going to do harm and the people in that community are going to agree that, you know, yes we need this or no we don't. I think it's it's a two way street and it's not ever been done before and I will change that. Gary and, and Claire, I think, have covered the policy and procedure part of it. I think part of your question, Frank, was uh, would my personal opinion as to whether something should be done or not done influence what I would do as a commissioner? The answer is no. Uh, I'm serving as a servant leader the people in Flathead County. It's their wishes, their plan, and the process that I would evaluate and look at to make my determinations. My personal opinion has nothing to do with my job. It's the 91,000 people out there that I'm serving and the due process that we have before us. Thank you. Absolutely correct. A, a personal opinion in a commissioner isn't how you determine what you're going to do. You determine what you're going to do how you're going to vote on any issue by what's presented to you. If the information from the developer, from the comments that come in and the people that uh, are concerned about this development, you listen to everybody, you see what they have to say, and then you make your decision not on whether you personally think it's a good idea or not. That, If we did that, <coughs> well, the results of that would be poor. Uh, I think if we, if, if we weren't able to distinguish between our, our opinion and the facts that we get on any given situation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how do people feel out there? I think we've covered most of what we need to cover. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I know you want to ask about the donut again, but I'm going to ask you to defer because uh, we did cover the donut already. Uh, at least in general. Um, I'm going to ask a kind of a concluding uh, question or two and let the uh, candidates take a few minutes to uh, wrap up their thoughts using this as kind of a way to organize their thoughts. Uh, two, two things. What is the biggest single challenge or obstacle facing Flathead County right now? And what would you do to overcome that challenge or obstacle? And you can tackle that or uh, or, and maybe you can do both. How are you uniquely qualified to serve the people of Flathead County as County Commissioner, guiding a budget of 75 million plus and making decisions that affect thousands of residents and property owners on a regular basis? So it's kind of about you, why you're able to, uh, to, to do this job and what you think you're most challenged by as you uh, 
uh, as you tackle it. And we'll go down the road from starting to fill. Yeah, boy, uh, at this point in this campaign, uh, when a citizen who's not a politician agrees to run for a public office, you find out that maybe one of the biggest problems we have in this valley is the polarization that we've got. That people on one side are so certain that they've got it all figured out. And likewise, the people on the other side have that same opinion. And they're not listening to one another. They're no longer talking to each other. And, well, they're talking at one another, but not to each other. And it really concerns me that so many letters to the editor and, oh God, don't go near the blogs unless you really want to have your blood pressure go up. But people just make outrageous statements about individuals running for, pu for public office that aren't true. And then other people read that and they go, my goodness, I had no idea that person was such a horrible human being. And it's all based on somebody's speculation about who that person is. And they go and they state it as if it's fact. So in my opinion, that's the worst problem we have to deal with right now in terms of getting things done, in terms of working together and getting things done. And how can I, I I've spent my entire life, my entire career, working career, 50, over 50 years of working, is working with people to find common ground to get things done. It, if you don't talk to one another and don't listen to each other, it's pretty hopeless. So I, as a county commissioner, I would try and make that happen by just listening and uh, being willing and respectful of other people to uh, see what they need on both sides. Thanks, Tom. Tom. Well, I'll answer both. Under the unique qualifications, I, I think there's enough information out there about my resume, what I've done in the past. That resume has crossed lines of party. It has set a precedent for dealing and working with all peoples under all types of situations and challenges. I think I offer that qualification. The other is, is that I am now in that qualification. I've been serving for six months as your county commissioner. I think my record is out there. Some of you may have seen the report card that's been out there. I saw it recently in the paper. I think if any of you have attended the public meetings and the sessions and the input and have called and talked to me, you found out what kind of a commissioner I am in representing all the people in the Flathead. So I think the qualifications are very clear. My agenda is that there is no agenda. I'm not a politician. I'm a servant leader. I've demonstrated that over and over again throughout my 36 years in the industry, business, and nonprofit ventures that I've been in. My goal is for the next two years to be your commissioner to do everything within my unbiased opinion to build on the foundation for the future prosperity of the Flathead. That is my singular goal. And I will do everything within my power, my experience, and my background to achieve that. Thank, Thank you. you. I am also not a politician. I am just a very con con concerned citizen here in the Flathead community. I will work, and as I have stated before, I will have an open door policy for anybody that wants to come in and talk with me. If we need to get other people in to speak on an issue that you have, I'm willing to listen. I think that's what we need. I feel in the past we have not had the opportunity to have commissioners that will listen to everybody except one side of the table. I do not want to be like that. I have been a servant of this community with my volunteer service that I have done to the community and plus also to the state of Montana. And I would love to continue this. And I would love to see this community prosper and grow. I've worked for large corporations. I actually worked for a Title V contractors where we employed 500 senior citizens. We kept them employed. They can help other seniors. I would love to see a program get started here and I would love to get it started. 
we need something to help our seniors. We need more things for our kids to do. I am concerned about our future. Our children are leaving here and they're not coming back. We need opportunities for them from the day they start rocking till they get out of high school. I would love to see a VOAD, a VOTEC educational program started here. We have some children that cannot afford to go to college. They do not want to go to college. This way it will give them an opportunity to grow here in the Flathead and be prosperous and good citizens. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. The biggest concern facing the Flathead today is jobs. We don't have the jobs here we need. We don't have the jobs here we need for families that are living here and traveling outside of this area. We don't have the good paying jobs that we need. Nobody's dream is to come back here to a low paying job. Their dream is to come back to this beautiful place. And I, I haven't, I have never wanted to leave a place like this. I was fortunate to keep a job here. They want to come back here to jobs that are good paying, jobs that they can raise their families, jobs that they can have children with and, and, send, and, and send those children to schools and better schools than they were at. And we can do that, and, and that's, a, that's a commitment I'm going to make. We do that by being business friendly. We have a county government that doesn't say, stay away, but how can I help you locate here? We have an outreach program that says, you have a corporate office over there, you look like you're gonna build another one, build it here in the valley. We have some things that if we can bring corporate or regional headquarters from, from corporations to this valley, it's offices, it's high paying jobs. Those people that are the CEOs of those companies have the ability to site their buildings wherever they want. And they can be sitting in their desk, pick up their student from school in a safe environment that we have here and be up skiing on the mountain. That's what the, some people want, and, and especially in the outdoor recreation area, like the guns that we have and like Cabela's and stuff. We need to bring those here. We need an outreach to say, we've got a really good place to come and start your business and, and or, or to move your business or expand your business so that we can have jobs for our kids. It's jobs, it's jobs, it's jobs. Thank you, Gary. Thank you to all the candidates. And thank you all for participating tonight. And we hope you're all well informed and ready to vote. Thanks.